Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Ira Katz Nelson. I teach political science and history at Columbia, and I'm currently serving as interim uh, provost. It's a it's a deep personal privilege for me to introduce the third Donna and Carol Hamilton Distinguished Annual Lecture, a series created by our dear colleague and friend uh, Charles Hamilton. Um, the first two lecturers, as many of you know, were uh, Stanley Greenberg, the noted pollster, um, who as a political scientist at Yale wrote a, a wonderful book on race and state in, uh, in South Africa in comparative perspective, and uh, Rosa DeLauro, who's um, uh, been representing the third district of Connecticut uh, in Congress since 1991. Allow me to say a, a word or two about uh, Carol and uh, Donna Hamilton, uh, both of whom um, I was uh, pleased and privileged uh, to know. Uh, uh, Carol was serving as press secretary to Commerce uh, uh, Secretary Ronald Brown at the time of her tragic death in uh, April 1996 in a plane crash outside uh, Dubrovnik in Croatia, a crash that also killed Secretary Brown and four other senior uh, staff members. Uh, Carol was a woman of a great ability um, and charm, and uh, she's someone I first met when she was uh, still a bit of a shy teenager. Um, uh, uh, Donna, uh, Charles, Charles Hamilton's uh, human and personal partner, uh, a person of great, great intellect and, and, and grace. Um, uh, she earned her, her doctorate uh, at Columbia uh, in the School of Social Work. And um, her book with uh, Charles, The Dual Agenda, Race and Social Policies of the Civil Rights Organization, um, was uh, grounded in her path-breaking dissertation that demonstrated how the agenda of uh, the American civil rights movement um, was never simply one of political and civil rights, but also was one of social and economic rights. And finally, before turning um, the session over to my dear colleague and friend, uh, Esther Fuch, a, a word about uh, Charles Hamilton, who of course needs absolutely uh, no introduction, um, but a matter of, of having the opportunity to repay a, a personal debt. Um, uh, uh, he arrived at Columbia uh, in the Department of Political Science uh, in the fall of 1969. Um, and I arrived uh, as a, a callow um, a young assistant professor the same year. Um, I was asked on my arrival by the chair of the department, Mr. Lake Wayne Wilcox, would I be willing to co-teach a course uh, with Charles Hamilton on race in the United States? Um, this had been, was a demand of our graduate students after the 1968 uh, campus uprising. Um, of course, I was thrilled to, to say yes, but also terrified. Um, uh, uh, Charles Hamilton had just published uh, Black Power with Stokely Carmichael. He was uh, a major figure in American uh, life, um, uh, an accomplished a person with a background in law and political science. Um, and I was in my, entering my first job. Uh, and with, um, in a manner of um, astonishing uh, human uh, uh, grace, um, uh, Professor Hamilton, I still think of him as Professor Hamilton, um, as well as a dear, being a dear friend, um, uh, treated me as if I belonged. Um, and I learned more in, from him than in, uh, in, in the time we taught together than I think I've learned from anyone in as concentrated a, a period. It was the period where I first um, learned to think about um, uh, institutional racism. Uh, a term he and Stokely Carmichael uh, coined, really, in, in their book. Um, and it was the first time I'd ever, in a sustained way, had conversations um, 
uh, 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 with um, an African American friend and colleague about the meaning and character of racism uh, in America. Um, that was a transformative experience for me, and I'm forever, ever grateful that this man of quiet courage, uh, great humor, uh, brilliant teaching, and humane sensibility um, was willing to put up with uh, uh, this uh, then quite ignorant junior colleague. Um, uh, I'm Esther Fuchs, who will now uh, uh, moderate and help lead this uh, uh, session, is Professor of International and Public Affairs and Political Science, a leader in our faculty, a person who connects thinking and doing in a, in a quite profound and effective way. But as I turn over to her, I also want to thank uh, Wilmot James um, for his leadership in making this event happen. Wilmot is a dear friend of Charles Hamilton, and uh, Charles's connections to South Africa, Wilmot's home, has been quite remarkable uh, ever since uh, uh, Charles Hamilton first visited uh, uh, South Africa more than 40 years ago. Um, on, on to Esther and on to this felicitous event. Uh, thank you, Ira. Uh, it's, it's always my, my great pleasure to be on a panel with uh, Ira Katz-Nelson, a giant in our field, someone who wrote about race in American politics and especially race in American cities. Uh, before the academy, especially political science, thought it was anything important to write about. And of course, um, just a personal thank you, Ira, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, your leadership at Columbia has been extraordinary during this really, really difficult moment. And we really thank you for taking the time to be part of this uh, lecture today. And thank you, Wilmot. You know, this is a wonderful, wonderful thing we have uh, each year to celebrate uh, the life of two extraordinary people and to honor our wonderful colleague, Chuck Hamilton. And just a point of personal privilege before we uh, continue with the serious topic we have before us today. Um, during the first lecture, uh, Chuck was able to be with us and uh, Ira reminded me because I had a paperback copy of Black Power that I had bought as a graduate student. And it, I think I, it cost, you know, about $3 at the time. Uh, I don't want to date myself. And I ra ran down to my office so I could bring it up to Chuck to show him <laughs> that I had had this book before I knew him. And uh, he took it from me and he signed it. And he said to me, now you can sell it on eBay for a lot of money. <laughs> and I thought, oh, we love you because uh, you always knew how to make us feel comfortable, uh, not just educate us, but bring us into your world. And, and I hope that you get to hear this today because I think we're gonna have a really wonderful afternoon. Uh, I do wanna quickly thank all the sponsors of our event today, um, the Department of Political Science who hosts this event every year, uh, SEPA and the Urban and Social Policy Program there, the African American and African Diaspora Studies Program here at Columbia, and of course the Academy of Political Science and our colleague Bob Shapiro, and all the wonderful staff at the Academy who has uh, made this happen, especially Lauren, who we work very closely with. This is a, uh, a perfect topic, in a way, for our uh, politics today, and the case for identity politics, polarization, demographic change, and racial appeals. And before I introduce our, our guest speaker, I just want to say thank you to him for writing this extraordinary book. It is available for purchase. We like to help all of our uh, speakers sell their books, even during COVID. So Chris, thanks so much uh, for being with us and for writing this book. Um, for those of us who have studied identity politics or maybe even just experienced it ourselves, 
we all know it has a, a double-edged meaning to it. Sometimes it can be viewed favorably as a way of bringing us together, as our former mayor David Dinkins used to call New York City the gorgeous mosaic, really telling us we could all have our identities in political life, but ultimately we have a lot in common. Uh, and then of course, there's the use of identity politics to divide us. So this is a moment in which we have to grapple with the concept of identity in American politics, both on the national scene, as well as in our state and local politics. And um, I feel strongly that we're going to learn a lot today about how to think about this concept and whether or not it can still be used in a non-ideological way to help us understand how politics actually works, uh, as opposed to a way in which it is often employed, um, deeply ideological and deeply divisive. I'd first like to introduce Chris Stout. Uh, Chris is an associate professor at the School of Public Policy at Oregon State University, and his research interests include racial and ethnic politics, gender and politics, political behavior, representation in Congress. He's also written Bring Race Back In, Black Politicians, Deracialization, and Voting Behavior in the Age of Obama. Uh, he will be our keynote in a sense, and then uh, Fred will be commenting afterwards, as well as Ira and Wilmot as they see fit. Fred Harris, I know everybody in the Columbia community knows Fred and his work. Um, he's been currently, like Ira, called to duty in the president's office. He's Dean of Social Science, as well as Professor of Political Science. Um, and he also serves as the director of the Center on African American Politics and Society here at Columbia. His research interests have been primarily in American politics with a focus on race and politics, political participation, social movements, and African-American politics. His most recent books are The Price of the Ticket, Barack Obama and the Rise and Decline of Black Politics, and with Robert Lieberman, Beyond Discrimination, Racial Inequality in a Post-Racist Era. Um, he's also the author of Something Within, Religion in African-American Political Act, uh, activism, which was awarded the V.O. Key Book Award by the Southern Political Science Association. Um, we're so glad you could join us today, Fred. I know you, you and Ira both have a lot on your plate right now, and I know having you here um, will really add significantly, significantly to the discussion. Um, for me, it's a personal delight to have you here, Fred. Um, you know, Ira needs no introduction. Uh, we all know his work, but uh, I will say he has written, I don't know, it, it's at least 10 or 15 books already. Uh, he's co-authored several books. Uh, he's edited volumes. Um, I just, everybody knows him now uh, as, as the interim pro provost. He's also the Ruggles Professor of Political Science and History and Deputy Director of Columbia World Projects. Um, one of his books that really affected me a lot recently is Fear Itself, The New Deal and the Origins of Our Time. This book won the Bancroft Prize. It's, it's a very important book and I, I would tell everybody to both buy it and read it. I'm gonna pitch books today because I think this is very important. Uh, the same thing obviously for Fred's books. Um, one of the, reasons that I became a political scientist was after reading Ira Katz Nelson's Black Men, White Cities. And uh, you were so ahead of your time, Ira, in thinking about this issue. And I really think we should do a symposium just on Black Men, White Cities. Maybe we'll get to do that soon. Uh, I hope everybody picks it up uh, from our local bookstore or orders it on Amazon. It's a really, prescient book uh, telling us so much about things that are happening right now before our very eyes. It's my pleasure now uh, to give the floor over to our keynote speaker. Uh, take it away, uh, 
I think this is going to be an exciting presentation. Christopher Stout. And unmute yourself, Chris. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, let me be Begin by saying it's really such an honor, um, as my slides are going in the wrong direction, uh, to be speaking here today. I really want to thank Professor Harris, Professor Katz Nelson, and Professor Fuchs uh, for, for being here. All of your work has been really inspirational in my career. I also want to thank Professor James for inviting me to speak today. Uh, one of the reasons this means so much to me is that the work of Professor Hamilton has really shaped my career. It, it has for a lot of young black political scientists. And as I'll talk about in a second, it's rare for uh, a political scientist like Hamilton to have such a large impact, not only in political science, but also on real world politics. So I can't express my gratitude enough for this opportunity and to at all be mentioned in the same breath as Professor Hamilton. So after Democrats faced a set of consecutive defeats in 1968 and 1972, and this shows how important Professor Hamilton was, the Democratic Party went to speak with Professor Hamilton to help them craft a strategy around racial politics going forward. And Hamilton, studying the conditions very carefully, noted that the Republican Party had been using the Democratic Party's use of targeted racial messaging as a way to turn off white voters. Uh, and this led them to lose a significant amount of support at the polls. And Hamilton, who was always interested in racial equality and racial justice, argued that the best way to advance black political interests would be for the party to focus on issues which universally helped people in poverty as blacks were disproportionately in poverty, including universal employment programs and universal health care. These types of programs would be accepted by the general population and would also disproportionately help blacks. However, targeted racial programs like busing affirmative action would turn off some white voters and make it so Democrats couldn't be elected. And so this strategy where candidates talk about non-racial liberal policies has been coined a deracialized strategy. And the goal of deracialized strategy is to advance black political interests uh, while focusing on non-racial issues. The deracialization hypothesis had an immediate and substantial effect in American politics. Jimmy Carter used it to succeed in the 19, 1976 election. Bill Clinton used it in the 1990 election. And beyond just looking at white politicians, it expanded where African-American elected officials uh, were elected. And this is best exemplified with the Black Tuesday candidates who on November 7, 1989, were elected in numerous majority white cities, uh, including Seattle, um, and others. It is also on this day where L. Douglas Wilder became the first black governor of any state as he was elected to the, governor, the governorship of Virginia. All of these candidates used Hamilton's framework for deracialization. And of course, the deracialization framework was most famously used by Barack Obama uh, in his 2008 presidential campaign. Beyond its impact on politics, you can imagine that a strategy this important led to a uh, generation of scholars trying to understand when and where deracialization is most effective and whether or not it's always effective. My own research on this topic is uh, discussed in my first book, Bringing Race Back In, in which I argue that African American candidates can use deracialized or can use racialized appeals in certain areas as long as they do so in a positive and constructive way. I was, I'm honored today, and I was even equally honored in uh, about four years ago in October of 2016, I was invited to a conference at Columbia University, the Black Power at 50. And it was at this conference where I first got to meet Dr. Hamilton, who is a superstar in the field. It was like meeting LeBron James uh, to me. So I was really excited for that opportunity. One of the things that we were tasked with uh, at this conference was to think about our own work and my own work on deracialization and racialization and compare it to Dr. Hamilton's work. And in this way, I found some conflict. I argue that a racialized appeal can be effective if done correctly. And Hamilton, at least in the 1970s, argued that we shouldn't use this. So I went back and I read Dr. Hamilton's work in the First World Journal, and this laid the groundwork for uh, my research. And it was here where Hamilton argued that a deracialized strategy, oh, I'm sorry, 
a deracialized strategy is not set in stone, that it's something that needed to be updated over time. And uh, a quote I pulled from his First World Journal it, um, states, the deracialization document was addressed to a strategy applicable to the electoral politics in the presidential context of 1976. It is not a strategy to be pursued at all times in all places. Whether it would or should apply in a local election with a majority black electorate remains to be calculated. How it should be applied in conjunction with protest and pressure group politics remains to be calculated, but at all times calculated is key. And when I read more about this, I thought, you know, Hamilton talks about deracialization and he says it works in certain contexts, but it, it shouldn't always be applied. And I think one of the things that we've, that political scientists have done and practitioners have done, have taken this work and assumed that the same pattern will work over time and not really delve deeply enough into whether or not as the context changed, a campaign which focused on progressive racial outreach can be effective. And so speaking in 2016, I had the strong expectation that things had changed and I wrote a short chapter about that. Uh, and then I decided this is an important enough topic that I should write a, a book about it. And um, the question I look at in this book and is the, the, the focus of the, this talk today is are progressive racial appeals advantageous in the current political landscape? If we apply the Hamilton framework to the current context, would he argue for more uh, racial outreach, more racial appeals, more discussion explicitly of race and discussions of public policy? And to really answer this question, I began by looking at what was the context in 1976 which made the deracialization strategy so effective? And I identified basically three key factors, although there's more that I discuss in the book. The first is the fear that white voters get turned off by racially targeted appeals. I think most Americans at least like the idea of equality of opportunity. And after the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, many Americans felt that they had done enough to address racial inequality in American politics. And so the expectation was that any other race targeted program would unfairly benefit blacks at the cost of whites. And so an example of this would be affirmative action. Uh, after the 64 Voting Rights, Civil Rights Act, there was the expectation that things were equal, policies had been set. And so why would you give African Americans an advantage uh, over whites. And so white voters, uni not universally, but close to universally rejected affirmative action type policies. And so in this case, anytime you talk about target, anytime politicians talk about targeted racial appeals, they're going to turn off white voters. And in most major in most settings uh, in the United States, you can't win elections without bringing in at least some white support. The second reason why the deracialization was so effective during the uh, 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, is that there was a large segment of the population who would swing between one party and another party depending on the presidential election. And so elections were largely decided by where these swing voters sat. And these swing voters weren't any, any random set of voters. They, were, they had a typical profile. They tended to be white working class voters who were economically liberal, but racially conservative. And so they liked the Democratic Party's platform on economic issues, but disliked the party's platform on racial issues. Given that, it makes sense to appeal to these voters who talk about the things that you agree with. The Democratic Party would talk about issues they agree with, uh, like raising the minimum wage, strengthening unions, and they would step away from issues that, they would, turn, that would turn off these voters, like affirmative action programs like busting and things like this. And so it was important to get these voters because they were a wide swath of the population and they swung between elections. The third is a more recently discussed uh, area of, uh, more recently discussed strength of the deracialization process or strategy. And that is that after the civil rights movement, uh, African-Americans born after that movement, particularly Generation X and millennials, tended to be much more racially conservative. Uh, they tended to believe that with hard work uh, and by adapting the norms of uh, white political culture, they could assimilate. And so they too started to reject racialized candidates. There's a fantastic book by uh, Charlton 
McElwain and Stephen Caliendo, in which they show that in experiments, that African Americans, particularly young African Americans, supported deracialized candidates over racialized candidates. In this way, uh, it, even the voters you might appeal to by talking about racial progressive policies weren't even buying, weren't even joining uh, those coalitions or supporting those candidates. So there was really no big benefit to talking about racially progressive policies. This starts to change, I believe, and others may disagree, in 2008. And a couple of things happened in 2008 and beyond, which start to lead people to be more cognizant of racial discrimination in the United States. The first, of course, is the election of Barack Obama. Barack Obama represents the American dream to many people. He's someone who's raised by a single parent, went to Columbia for undergrad, Harvard uh, for law school, and then became president of the United States. Many African Americans uh, interviewed during this period of time said, if a Barack Obama succeeds, uh, this is an example that with hard work anyone can succeed. And this is particularly true amongst whites who hope that this rush ushered in Barack Obama's election, ushered in an era of post, uh, a post-racial America where race no longer mattered. But even though people were pretty hopeful after Barack Obama's election, these dreams were quickly dashed when soon after his election, a social movement arose uh, known as the Tea Party, which ostensibly was worried about uh, growing deficits, but had made numerous uh, racially charged remarks to Obama. So for example, many in the Tea Party charged that Obama wasn't born in the United States, that he was a Muslim. In dealing with members of the Tea Party, members of the Congressional Black Caucus said that they were, uh, they were racial epithets were yelled at them, and all of this starts to raise concerns that maybe we weren't entering a post-racial society. And regardless of what the Tea Party's motivations were, numerous public opinion polls show that a majority of uh, Americans viewed them to be driven by racial animus rather than policy. And so now we start to see a growing recognition that we hadn't achieved what we hoped to achieve with the election of Barack Obama. We weren't in a post-racial society. And this becomes further exacerbated uh, with the shooting of Trayvon Martin in Florida and the acquittal of a self-appointed um, night watchman, George Zimmerman. This sparks an online movement known as Black Lives Matter, started by three Black women. And this Bla Black Lives Matter movement explodes in the summer of 2014, in which Michael Brown is killed by police officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. And after this happened, there's just cascading events where people are seeing videos of African Americans being brutalized by law enforcement and vigilantes. And so this leads to a real awakening in the United States that we, were, we have not achieved a, a post-racial society. And so I think academics have long known that this wasn't the case. I think the public starts to join in on a show, a couple of public opinion polls showing that in a second. And I wanna note quickly that my data ends in 2016, but we see what happened over this summer as really kind of furthering a lot of these issues. Uh, there's a Pew poll, which I have on the side of the slide here, which shows that seven, 10 Ameri seven in 10 Americans after the, the shootings of, um, or after the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor discussed race or had conversations about race and racism. So this idea that we could just blindly think that things had resolved and that race was no longer a problem has been dashed in recent years. And so one of the things that occurs after this growing racial reckoning is that Americans become much more likely to believe that more needs to change in the United States to give blacks equal rights. So the Pew has several polls. Uh, and here I look at white voters and I disaggregate by whether or not they're liberal, moderate, or conservative. And I look at the percent who agree with the statement or strongly agree with the statement that more needs to change to give black blacks equal rights in the United States. Uh, the darkest line, which is at top, is for white liberals. And we can see between 2014, which was this poll was taken before uh, Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, and 2015, which is taking about six months afterwards, um, that white liberals became about 16% more likely to believe that more needs to change and to address racial inequality in the United States. I, and I would guess that if we looked at this poll today, if there was data from 2020, we would see this even growing further. 
uh, white independents or white moderates to a majority believe that more needs to change to give blacks equal rights. And even Republicans or liberal conservatives became more likely to agree with the statement over time. If you put all of these numbers together, it was close to 60% of Americans believe that more needed to change to give blacks equal rights. Along the same lines, um, as a measure that social scientists often use to measure racial discrimination, and this is known as racial resentment, racial resentment kind of measures covert racism or cultural racism. And it's based off the idea that African Americans are in the position that they're in. If you have high levels of racial resentment, you think African Americans are in the position that they're in because they don't work hard enough and not because of systematic barriers. I looked at this for all years and uh, 2016 for three different groups of whites, white Democrats, white independents, and white Republicans. The bottom line here is white Democrats. And you can see that between the 2012 data set and the 2016 data set, there's a precipitous drop in the number of white and white Democrats levels of racial resentment. So white Democrats become much less likely uh, to believe that African Americans are in the position they are in because of lack of hard work and more likely to believe that this is driven by systematic problems. This is also true to a much lesser degree uh, for white political independents who in 2016 scored lowest on this racial resentment measure. And so all of this kind of adds up to this idea, or at least my argument, that white, some whites will be more supportive of racial outreach. And again, I return to the American National Election Study. And the American National Election Study asked individuals, if you had to yourself deal with racial inequality, what's the best way to deal with it? Do you think that, on one hand, uh, blacks should help themselves, and that's going to lead to a change in racial inequality? Or do you think government needs Govern, you need more government policies to address racial inequality. And the dark line, again, is for white Democrats here. And uh, in 2016, which is the very last part of this, you see that whites became more supportive for really only the second time since this question was asked, that government aid needs to be, uh, that African Americans need some progressive policies, racially progressive policies, to address racial inequality. Uh, it's the largest in 2016 that it had ever been, and it remains relatively steady for the other groups, although it declined significantly for Republicans during this period of time. So in sum, it does look like the first part of the argument that deracialization will universally turn off white voters might not be the case. Particularly white Democrats might be mobilized by candidates who are making racial outreach in the current political context. The other argument that makes deracialization effective is that there are swing voters that are deciding elections. And this, of course, is true during this period of time. Uh, the Democratic Party had a real large problem uh, after the signing of the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act electorally. So before this, the New Deal Coalition, which was a coalition of one of the broadest coalitions in American politics, included strange bedfellows in African Americans and Southern whites who were universally opposed to progressive racial policies. Uh, one good example of this would be Senator Richard Russell Jr. of Georgia, who in some ways epitomizes the extremes of the Reagan Democrats. He was someone who was a champion of the University of Georgia uh, system, so he was a strong advocate for public education. He authored the National uh, School Lunch Program, so school lunch. Pro, uh, providing school lunches for children in poverty. Uh, and at the same time that he advanced progressive economic, a uh, progressive economic agenda, he also was the co-author of the Southern Manifesto, which argued that Southern states should ignore the Brown versus Board of Education um, decision. And so the Democrats faced real pressure of how to balance these twin concerns with these different groups. Um, and so this is why the deracialization strategy I mentioned earlier was so effective. What happens during the 2000s and really gets exacerbated in 2008 is we enter a period of political polarization where people start to choose sides based off of the issues that they select and voters become less likely to swing. And this makes it so that in general elections, people side with their political parties. If I'm a Democrat, I vote for the Democratic Party. If I'm a Republican, I vote with the Republican Party. In 2008, after Barack Obama is elected, this divide becomes exacerbated around, your, around individuals' views of race. So race becomes the dividing cleavage in American politics. 
This is outlined in Michael Tesler's book, uh, Most Racial or Post, Post Racial or Most Racial. Uh, what happens then is that if you view Blacks favorably or view Latinx as favorably or view Asian Americans favor favorably, regardless of your class, you start to join the Democratic Party. And if you view these groups negative, negatively, regardless of your other opinions about American politics or your economic class, you start to join the Republican Party. And so these two groups become more and more polarized over time as there's a feedback loop between uh, racially progressives joining the Democratic Party, Democratic Party elite seeing this, talking about racial appeals, and it moves them further to the left on these issues. Republicans see that their base becomes racially conservative whites. Uh, then they start to double down on these racially conservative issues, and there's a feedback loop, which then leads them to become more racially conservative. So in this way, we we end a period where there's a lot of polarization, or where there's a lot of swing voters, and swing voters largely decline, and they decline around issues of race. And so here's a graph that I have uh, showing this a little bit. Here I use Larry Bartels, who's a political scientist, definition of what is a working class person and a, an elite class person. A working class individual is someone who is in the lower third uh, in income and does not have a, and only has a high school degree. Someone in the elite class is someone who's in the top third in terms of income in the United States and has at least a college degree. I further disaggregate these groups by whether or not they have high levels of racial resentment. So I take the median score. Do you think African Americans are in the position that they're in because they haven't because they haven't worked hard enough? Uh, if you believe yes and more yes than no, then you go into the high racial resentment group. And if you think that African Americans are in the position they're in because of systematic racism, then you go into the low treatment group. And you can see in the 1990s and early 2000s that there's not a big difference. Your class is really the dividing factor here. But as you move into 2008 and even more so into 2016, class becomes less of a, a divider. And here your views on race become much more of, uh, of a, a reason for polarization. I'll mention I, in the book, I also talk about vote choice and white working class voters with low levels of racial resentment vote for the Democratic Party in 2016 at a rate of close to 85 percent, which is not dissimilar from African-Americans. The other thing to note in this graph here is that uh, the real divide, again, is less than class and there's not large differences. Uh, be the larger differences are between whether or not you see you have higher or low levels of racial resentment rather than if you're working class or elite class. So in this way, you see coalitions of working class and elite class voters uh, coalescing around their opinions on race. And so this changes how American campaigns are run, really starting in 2000s with Carl Rove's strategy for the W. Bush campaign, is less the focus on swing voters. Voters are largely decided in who they're going to support. Uh, what really changes elections is, can you get your base enthusiastic about your candidate? And so in this way, campaigns are won and lost on turnout. And if this is the case, uh, as Americans have become more divided by race, and as I shown earlier, white Democrats become much more supportive of a racially progressive agenda, it's possible then that you can win elections by really mobilizing white Democrats along with other groups. And by discussing races, I'll talk a, a little bit about a little bit later in the talk, uh, this can be a way to really mobilize that group. Another thing to point out is that Clinton in 2016 lost, and there's been a lot of work now discussing that the reason that she lost wasn't simply because she lost a lot of swing voters, although there were, were some Obama Trump voters. Uh, one of the main reasons she lost is that there was much levels, lower levels of turnout amongst her base, uh, and that a lot of her base or the Democratic Party's base voted for third party candidates. And so a wonderful, wonderful work by Bernard Fraga and colleagues showed that had Hillary Clinton had the same black turnout as Barack Obama in 2008, she would have won Wisconsin, she would have won Michigan, she would have won Pennsylvania and the White House. So the loss in 2016 in part was uh, due to lack of mobilization. And this again is not to minimize the fact that some voters did sweet, switch, but even with the switching had mobilization, had enthusiasm been higher for her campaign, uh, she might have gone on to win. And so for whites, uh, in the book I argue, and here I've argued that there are some who are gonna be much more supportive of a racially progressive agenda. And I think the same thing is true for African-Americans as well. As I mentioned, 
there's a lot of uh, great work uh, on on showing that the post civil rights generation uh, of African Americans tends to have lower levels of racial consciousness. Uh, Candace Watt Smith is someone who's done a lot of work in this area and really fantastic work in this area. And so for most of the 90s and 2000s, there was discussion among blacks that they wanted a new politician. They wanted a politician, an African-American politician like Barack Obama, who ran a deracialized campaign. Ellis Coast, who's a journalist, wrote a book, The End of Anger. And in it, he interviews a lot of African-American, uh, younger African-Americans. And they talk about this, that the way to succeed in large part is to assimilate. And that if you assimilate and, and adopt to the mainstream, mainstream culture, then you, you can succeed. And they wanted their politicians to do similar things. The Black Lives Matter movement and the Tea Party really changed Blacks' perceptions of racial consciousness in American politics. The New York Times held a forum after the murder of Trayvon Martin in 2012, asking Blacks how they felt. And many described this as a racially, racial awakening. They said things like, Trayvon Martin is this generation's Emmett Till. If Emmett Till spurred the civil rights movement, then Trayvon Martin did the same thing for African Americans uh, in 2012. Many said, I had hoped that Barack Obama was a, an example that we had gotten past race and racism and that with hard work we can succeed. But seeing what happened to Trayvon Martin, see how Obama's being treated by uh, conservatives in the United States really led to a change in how they viewed their own position. And so African-Americans, so one of the things I looked at to see whether or not there was a change in consciousness is a measure of linked fate. And linked fate is basically measured at, by a question which asks, how much do you think what happens to other African-Americans in the United States has an impact on you? Numerous studies show that African-Americans with higher levels of linked fate are much more likely to support racially progressive policies and are much more likely to identify with the Democratic Party. And you can see uh, really an amazing change happen. This is all measured, this is measured by several public, national public opinion polls. Uh, but the starkest difference happens between the 2012, and here I use the American National Election Study, and 2016 American National Election Study, which shows a huge increase in Blacks' attitudes about linked fate. That what happens to other African Americans has a large impact on their own uh, on their own lives. And so again, this might lead to a change in support for racially progressive uh, candidates. The other group that I look at closely in this book is uh, Latinxes. And Latinxes tend to be more divided by national origin groups. So Puerto Ricans, Cubans, Mexican Americans, Central Americans that have their own uh, national identity and don't really see commonalities between themselves and other uh, uh, Latinos. One of the things that also happens during the rise of the Tea Party is that there are numerous policies targeting uh, Latinx, particularly Latinx immigrants, and there's a large increase in hate crimes against Latinos. This is also further, uh, further demonstrated by Trump's announcement speech, uh, presidential announcement speech, in which he calls Mexican Americans rapists, murderers, and drug dealers. And there's research which shows that where Trump had his rallies, there was an increase in hate crimes, uh, and particularly amongst Latinxes. And so while African Americans too are experiencing an increase in racial consciousness, Latinos also are experiencing an increase in racial consciousness. So here I look at Latino linked fate. Do you think what happens to other Latinos broadly uh, has an effect on your own identity? And if we look in 2012 here, at the American National Election Study in 2012, a majority of Latinos would say, not really, right? A majority would say not, or none or a little combined, that what happens to other Latinos in my pan-ethnic group has no real effect on my own life outcomes. But once you move into 2016, the year that Donald Trump is president, a majority, in fact, a supermajority, 64%, almost a supermajority, agree that what happens to other Latinos has a large effect on what happens in my own life. And so for these reasons, uh, we see a renewal in racial consciousness uh, amongst Latinos and Blacks as well. A group that I don't talk uh, as much about in the book is Asian Americans. I do discuss them a little bit in the conclusion, and they're as the fastest growing racial ethnic group in the United States too. Uh, right before the 
2016 election have lower levels of link bait than they do right after. So they too seem to be following a similar pattern, although I don't have as good a data on that uh, racial and ethnic group. And so all of this kind of leads to my argument that things have changed in the United States where white Democrats, uh, blacks, Latinos have become much more racially progressive and look to the Democratic Party to provide some type of relief to racial inequality in the United States. At the same time, polarization makes it so we're set in our vote choice that Democrats vote for Democrats, Republicans vote for Republicans, and independents are really just shy partisans for the most part. Those who are, though they're either consistently Democrat or consistently Republican uh, voters, but don't want to identify with either political party. And there's a small segment that swings, but most of elections now are based on turnout. And so I wanted to see then, do candidates who focus on racially progressive outreach perform better in elections? Uh, and so I have multiple tests. I'm just going to present two here today. The first is looking at measures of racial progressivism. So one of the things that the American Na National Election Study asks people is thinking about the Democratic presidential candidate in a year. So Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012, John Kerry in 2004, Al Gore in 2000, Hillary Clinton in 2016. Thinking about those individuals, do you think that they think the best way to address racial inequality is to make changes in government, and that's on one end of the scale? Or do you think the best way to make changes is that blacks should help themselves and there shouldn't be any type of racial outreach? And so I asked, so Danny has asked voters to place them on the scale. Of course, higher scores on the scale mean that you're more likely to believe that the, that the elected official, the, the presidential candidate, thinks that the government needs to address racial inequality uh, head on rather than just have a laissez-faire approach where the, the, the market sets things. Sets things. Uh, so that's what I use my independent variable. And then I use that to predict vote choice. And this is measured, did you vote for the Democratic candidate or not? Or did you vote for another candidate? And then turn out, did you vote in that election or not? And both of these are self-reported. Um, I anticipate and I control for numerous factors that would also predict uh, um, vote choice. I don't control for partisanship because I look at different groups of partisans that I'll talk about in a second. I anticipated, based off of my review, that polarization would make it so that in 2016, perceptions of racial liberalism wouldn't matter. If you're a Democrat, you're going to vote for the Democratic Party. If you're a Republican, you vote for the Republican Party, and the same for the independents. What I did think it would matter in turnout, candidates who put forth a racially progressive agenda are going to mobilize voters to be more likely to turn out. And so this is where Democrats might make significant gains by talking about racial issues. And so the results of test one are, as expected, uh, polarization basically drives vote choice. And for, there are some years, particularly Barack Obama, Barack Obama seen as being racially progressive, then white Democrats, white independents are less likely to vote for him. In 2016, uh, that all disappears. <laughs> that, um, regardless of whether people saw Hillary Clinton as racially progressive or not, and this is true for white Democrats, white independents, white Republicans, African Americans and Latinos, they were going to be more, they, that didn't have any effect on their vote choice. Whether she was racially progressive or racially conservative, voters had made up their minds beforehand and party really is the strongest predictor of vote choice. But when I look at turnout, there's a, a, a large and significant relationship where white Democrats, African Americans, and Latinxes all become more likely to vote in 2016 when they perceive Hillary Clinton as being racially liberal. And there's no relationship for any other candidate in any of the other years. So it shows that in the current political context, discussions of racial appeals can mobilize African American candidates. Uh, I guess a quick note, and this is, I think, where more research needs to be done. Uh, Hillary Clinton did make racial appeals, right? And so Hillary Clinton, spoke, the mothers of the movement who were tied to the Black Lives Matter movement, were given a primetime spot at the Democratic uh, National Convention. Hillary Clinton talked about Black Lives Matter in her campaign. She had a section on her website called Racial Justice. So she did make racial, uh, progressive racial appeals. Uh, so why then wasn't there higher levels of turnout? This is something that's kind of a question, but one of the reasons for that could be driven by the fact that there was a heavy campaign 
both by the Trump administration and by Russian troll farms to paint Hillary Clinton as being more racially conservative than she was. We know the Trump campaign ran an advertisement uh, called Super Predators in which she brought up a comment that she made in the 1990s. Um, and in the commercial, they say, this is how Hillary Clinton talks about black youth. And we know also more recently that the campaign had a, a deterrence program, uh, the Trump campaign had a deterrence program that was aimed at African Americans to get them to think that Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party didn't care about them. So all of these might be a reason why her progressive racial appeals weren't effective in 2016, or that more voters didn't see her as being racially progressive in 2016. Um, the other thing that I do is I run a set of experiments. I run them on MTurk, but I've since done several other studies on Lucid Academia and on uh, Qualtrics and find similar results. And here I ran an experiment where I randomly assigned individuals to one of two candidates. Or, um, and those candidates talked about either uh, economically liberal uh, issues or racially liberal issues. So one candidate talks about racial justice in which he, he argues for strengthening the Voting Rights Act, fixing our broken criminal justice system, and pro uh, protecting immigrants' rights and advocate for comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, the other half randomly were assigned to a candidate who talked about economic justice, strengthen the nation, National Labor Relations Act, fix our broken financial system, and protect workers' rights and advocate for a mandatory living wage. And so if, I, if my expectations are correct, again, in the general election, parties should wipe things out. And here, I have two candidates who I say are Democratic candidates who could be presidential candidates in 2020. This was done in 2017 before the race was set. So most voters probably wouldn't know that this person didn't exist. Um, after they read these two different experiments, I asked, would you vote for this candidate in the primaries against Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton? Would you vote for this candidate in the general election if the opponent is Mitt Romney or Donald Trump? And then I asked, how enthusiastic would you be to vote if these candidates were on the ballot in 2020? And so I again expect that the racial justice candidate will at least increase enthusiasm to vote. And so what I find is in the primaries, there actually is preference, particularly amongst African Americans, who are much more supportive of the racially liberal candidate than they are of the economically candidate, uh, economically liberal candidate when pitted against Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders. But as was true in the American National Election Study, your party determined who you were going to vote for. Democrats were more likely to vote for the hypothetical Democratic candidate against Mitt Romney or against uh, Donald Trump in 2020, and Republicans and those leaning in that direction were more likely to vote for the Republican candidate in those years. And so whether or not, the, whether or not you got the economically liberal candidate or the uh, racially liberal candidate in the general election, it didn't really affect vote choice. But again, I found that white Democrats, Blacks, and Latinxes expressed more enthusiasm to vote when the racialized candidate was on the ballot. They were much more likely to say, I, I really support this candidate and I'd, be, I'd turn out if that candidate was on the ballot. And so I think one thing to consider uh, is now, hopeful, and I hopefully have shown uh, evidence of this, that white Democrats, Blacks, and Latinos tend to be much more enthusiastic to vote uh, with racially progressive candidates rather than deracialized or deracialized candidates. One of the things that makes this coalition of voters much more formidable going into the future is that the country is changing rapidly in its demography. There are several states that are already in majority minority, including California, Hawaii, New Mexico, and Texas. Uh, several states will become majority minority in the next 10 years, including Nevada, Maryland, Georgia, Florida, Arizona, New Jersey, and New York. And then uh, the majority of the country will be majority minority by 2050 and several, by 2044, and several states will also be majority minority, including Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, and Virginia. When I say majority min minority, I mean uh, that racial and ethnic minorities, although will, racial and ethnic minorities combined will be the majority of the population and whites will only believe the plurality of the population. And so as these groups change demographically, assuming that they vote for the Democratic Party, which is not always a, a safe assumption, uh, but we do know that they're more mobilized and supportive of, uh, of racially progressive candidates. 
And so putting together a coalition of these voters could be a pathway to success nationally and in several states. Uh, a good example of this is this really is the Obama coalition. Obama got less of the white vote in 2012 than Michael Dukakis received in 1988. And he was able, and while Michael Dukakis was wiped out by George H.W. Bush, Barack Obama won with a majority of votes by being able to put, to co put together a coalition of white Democrats, uh, African Americans and Latinxes, and also Asian Americans and other uh, underrepresented groups. And so one of the arguments that I make in my book, assuming that the context remains constant where voters are more likely to agree that racial discrimination continues to be a problem, discussing racial issues becomes much more of a potent strategy going into the future because, um, because these groups grow as a size of the population and as a size of the electorate. And we're kind of already seeing this in several states. So Arizona, for example, was a state that was safely, um, safely Republican is now becoming much more democratic. And states like Georgia, which will soon be majority minority, uh, and Texas, which, whose electorate is now majority minority, uh, are becoming much more competitive than they've been in the past. And so in conclusion, uh, I think Dr. Hamilton implores us to really think about the political context uh, when applying the deracialization strategy. And of course, context change, can change a lot over time. And I expect that it'll change in the near future. And he calls on us to constantly update this model, to think about how the context is shaping uh, use of racial appeals. In my book, I argue that polarization, um, the polarization has made it so that we no longer, or parties should think less about cross-pressured voters and think more about mobilizing voters. Uh, and a deracial, deracialization strategy actually presses, rather increases turnout amongst uh, the Obama coalition of Democratic whites, Blacks, and Latinos. And demographic changes really provide a larger advantage to this. One of the things that probably certainly the best part of my book is that uh, Professor Hamilton wrote the forward and I reread it again last night. And what took me 250 pages to write, he wrote it in two pages. So see, just the real succinct encapsulation of, uh, encapsulated my argument in a much more eloquent and uh, really, uh, uh, I think a much better way than my own. And so I, again, am really honored to, to, present and I can't express enough my gratitude, Professor Hamilton, for his work in this area. And so thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Thanks so much, Chris. There is so much uh, you covered in your presentation. I'm going to ask those in the audience who want to submit questions to do it through the Q&A uh, link on the Zoom. And now I'm going to ask Fred to comment. Fred, unmute. And you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, thanks so much, much, Chris, for that um, wonderful presentation. And congratulations on the new book, The Case for Identity Politics, uh, Polarization, Demographic Change, and Racial Appeals. Um, I have to say before I go into my comments that I remember when Chris presented aspects of these arguments um, at a conference on deracialization at uh, Nuffield College, Oxford. And the uh, conference, as you remember, Chris, uh, the topic was on black politics in a colorblind era, reexamining uh, racial deracialization. And Chris also presented, as he mentioned earlier, at the commemorative conference held at Columbia in, uh, in honor of uh, Chuck Hamilton that celebrated the 50 year mark of the publication of, of, of Hamilton's and Touré's book. Uh, black Power, the Liberation, the Politics of Liberation. So um, in many ways, the book Black Power laid the foundations for scholarship on what has become known today as identity politics. Um, the book Black Power discussed the need for African Americans as a marginalized group in American life um, to close ranks, uh, to see themselves as a collective political force. And as Chuck Hamilton noted then, and when he usually gives, instructs people about what he meant about identity politics in the book Black Power, 
um, he always refers to page 44, um, where it is written, before any group can enter the open society, it must first close ranks. Now, this call for the practice, this was basically a call for um, ethnic pluralism um, to be practiced among African Americans. Um, and as we've seen, this call of identity politics, uh, other ma ma marginalized groups, whether it's um, Latinx communities or LGBTQ activists, um, the idea of, of, of identity politics has uh, gained far more currency um, in American politics now than it did, I would argue, um, then. Given the, the, the search for recognition, the search for rights of, of different um, groups that identify themselves um, in a particular way in American political life. Now, um, I want to go, I'm not going to go forward um, as Chris did um, uh, from Black Power from the late 60s to 70s. I want to go back in a reflective way because um, I want to make the argument that um, the, uh, that the, the uses of identity politics uh, or the idea um, in the book, uh, making the case for identity politics, that the case has already uh, been made if we look at it from, from a historical lens. And not so much from a marginalized community uh, uh, of African Americans and other marginalized groups, but actually from um, the practice of white identity politics. And I'll tell you what I mean by that um, in a moment. So both Hamilton and Toure saw what, uh, what um, white ethnic groups were doing in the United States in the time that they were writing. And what they had done in cities, particularly what they had done in cities across the US. So, you know, the Poles and the Irish had banded together in solidarity to gain political power and recognition in a city like Chicago. Um, in New York, of uh, different ethnic groups then and now, um, predominantly then, um, uh, European immigrants and their descendants formed and dominated party organizations and enclaves across the five boroughs in New York City. Boston was dominated by the Irish, Philadelphia by the Italians. These groups closed ranks to gain, in order to gain political power and to help to facilitate integration and assimilation of European immigrants into American political life. So while they were collectively known as white ethnics, um, their identities were not devoid of their own process of racial identity formation. And I think providing this longer view, this, this longer context, helps us to understand what's going on um, in contemporary American political life around the issues of identity. So historians and political scientists have um, long written about uh, how various European groups um, not only became white, but, but they also, uh, those who became white, also developed a politically conscious white racial identity. Included here, um, there are many works, but particularly um, David Rodiger's book, uh, Working Toward Whiteness, How American Immigrants Became White, and particularly Matthew Jacobson's Whiteness of a Different Color, European Immigrants and the Alchemy of Race. Um, these works document uh, the racialization of Europeans and their descendants in the United States. Now the process of the formation of a white identity in US, in, in my view, raised questions about how this, form in, how this form of identity uh, formation influenced American politics then, and as I said before, how it influenced it in, in contemporary, American politics, contemporary American politics. If we understand the historical formation of a racialization of people who became known as white in the United States, a formation I would argue that developed over centuries there would be no need to make a case for identity politics today. I would argue that the case has already been made. Um, and so to, to provide some context to what I mean here, I'm gonna draw actually on the work of a political theorist, um, Judith Scalar uh, in particular in her book, American Citizenship, The Quest for Inclusion. Uh, as well as the work of our colleague who's on this panel, Ira Katz Nelson in his book, When Affirmative Action Was White, The Untold Story of Racial Inequality in 20th Century America. 
Though Scalar did not specifically discuss the role of identity politics and how Americans throughout, uh, uh, throughout have talked about their, their need to earn a right to a living wage and their right to the franchise, the politics of identity has had a long history in American life. Each group of people of European descent, when advocating for their rights, women suffragists, union, union organizers, define themselves against the enslaved and their descendants. As Scalar observed, the meaning of American citizenship was birthed as a counterpoint to chattel slavery. So the quest for inclusion for civic recognition in the United States has been tied to, to gaining the right to the franchise and having the right to earn a living as a free worker. These were two rights that slaves were denied and their descendants continuously fought for after emancipation. So to quote Scalar, um, in the US, she argued, to be less than a full citizen is at the very least to approach the dreaded condition of a slave. Um, Ira Katz Nelson documents in When Affirmative Action Was White, how the New Deal policies, and we heard through Chris the importance of the New Deal coalition, um, New Deal policies conferred material benefits to whites while excluding many of those benefits to African Americans. Uh, some social policies, um, many of us already know this story, um, disproportionately excluded African Americans without ever mentioning race in the crafting of those policies. For instance, the Social Security Act initially did not cover domestic workers and agricultural workers, two occupations that were dominated by African Americans during the period of the creation of the act. This provision uh, was pushed um, by Southern members of Congress who wanted to continue to control um, black labor in the South. Um, so again, um, identity politics has been um, with us for quite a while. Uh, part of it is what I see in the historic moment that we're in now, or the moment that we're in now rather, um, is a, 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 as a resurgence of, of white identity. Um, and this occurred not so much under Trump, but it's already been mentioned by Chris a moment ago, also during the presidency of Barack Obama. Um, uh, white identities have become far more politicized than they uh, used to be in the post-civil rights, if you, looking within the post-civil rights era. Uh, today, for instance, about half of white Americans believe that white people as a group are discriminated against. Um, uh, against uh, and against this backdrop, we have seen the resurgence of what I would describe as a hardcore white, white identities in the Trump era. Um, known more um, famously as white supremacy um, uh, uh, and the rise of hate groups. Uh, so given the rise of identity politics, marginalized groups, as Chris has documented in, in his book, and what, to, what appears to be the rise of a white, white racial identities of various sorts, so just not sort of white supremacist organizations. Um, there's an interesting study by the political scientist uh, Ashley Jardina. She's at Duke University. She has a book called White Racial Identity. And what she reports in the study is that somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of whites today view their racial identity in a political, meaningful way. So with the rise of, 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 of making the case for racial identity politics or identity politics, and with the rise of sort of white identity politics um, in various uh, manifestations. Um, what I see is a continuing polarization in, in American politics for many, many years to come. So um, that's my starting uh, comments. Um, I hope to have a robust discussion about, <laughs> about okay. some of the points that uh, I've made. So. Uh, before we're going to ask Chris to respond uh, and discuss, uh, I'd like to ask Ira Katz-Nelson uh, to please comment. Ira, unmute. Chris, thank you so much for this uh, vibrant talk and for the really terrifically interesting book. Uh, much appreciated. Um, 
I, I would put the question you raised in the following way. Under what condition does, uh, do, does the politics of racial appeal um, uh, geared to increase turnout um, become more significant than a politics of a deracialized politics appealing to swing the voters? And that's, that's my shorthand for your question. And I would ask the following, not whether we should answer that question once and for all, but exactly as you say, and exactly as Professor Hamilton uh, has uh, insisted from the beginning, um, uh, the right question is, under what conditions um, will one or the other hold? And that leads me to two forms of um, uh, speculation, as it were, about which large-scale changes in American life since, say, the middle of the 20th century um, would most help shape that answer? Um, not give us the answer, but create the conditions for exploring the answer. And I, my own list is four. Um, uh, uh, one you touched on and underscored, uh, the demographic change. Uh, I, I won't repeat what you, um, what you said. Um, Second is um, a really quite profound religious transformation, uh, particularly within American Protestantism. Uh, in 1950, the mainstream uh, Protestant churches um, were dominant, and evangelicals were, if anything, not only a minority of Protestants, but uh, well outside ordinary politics. Um, uh, ever since the 1920s the Scopes trial, uh, on evolution, evangelicals uh, became some of the largest non-voters for a long time in American life. Um, this utterly has been transformed in a double sense. Um, mainstream Protestant denominations have declined significantly in membership and uh, evangelical churches have been dramatically on the rise and became politicized, um, not least around issues of um, abortion and sexuality, uh, but also from time to time around issues of race. Um, the third big change, not unrelated to the evangelical uh, rise, uh, has been the, the profound realignment of politics in the American South. Um, uh, a once secure democratic haven in the age of Jim Crow has become not an entirely secure Republican haven, but Republicans begin any presidential election as Democrats once did with a, a big uh, a priori boost from uh, the Southern uh, states. Uh, and, 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 and finally, and not um, trivially, um, because this affects the swing of white voters, um, the decline of uh, trade unions, of private unions, uh, industrial unions. In 1950 to 55, uh, just over two, just over one third of all private wage workers, peaking at 35, 36 percent in the mid 1950s, belonged to unions. Today, it's about six percent. Um, and the unions um, were and continue to be active in interpreting politics for their members. They don't just win uh, benefits, but they. So the interpretation of why the industrial base has collapsed or, uh, and so on, th these, these matters were interpreted by unions. But the absence of unions, the realignment of the South, religious changes and demographic changes were all in the mix, both for the Obama and Trump uh, campaign and victories and for Hillary's um, defeat. And the second big set of transformation um, I think they have come within the meaning of being black in America uh, or the African American condition, which is immensely complicated. Um, and it would be much too simple to talk about a racial or racist versus non racial or non racist uh, world. If you think about different dimensions of physical segregation, for example, or um, uh, physical security, vis a vis police. Um, or uh, the place of African Americans within the larger culture of the United States. And by culture, I mean uh, everything from uh, 
presence or absence in television and movies, uh, to music, uh, to sports, uh, you name it. Um, uh, and uh, the place of blacks in the political economy of the United States, which has dramatically bifurcated with, uh, 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 in the, since the 1950s. And finally, the place of African Americans in political life. Um, each, each one of these is complex and somewhat different than it was. Um, so a racial appeal, an identity appeal, would have different meaning today. Um, uh, and its stress would have different meaning. So the issue of policing, for example, which has come to the fore um, and, and with incredibly ugly and tragic uh, 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 events, as you've underscored, um, gives one kind of mobilization. But um, but there are other forms of racial mobilization which are less prominent, um, uh, and so on. So I think what I would love to see is uh, hearing your comments about how these macro changes to America and how the changes particularly, uh, one could do the same for, uh, for Latinx uh, population, but for African Americans, the, the transformations over a longest period of time, the, 60, 70 years in condition shape the meaning of deracialization as, um, or racialization as appeal. And finally, two footnotes. Um, one, you compared the Obama um, white vote to the caucuses, but if you had compared it to Kerry's, you would have reached a different conclusion because uh, Obama did better than Kerry amongst whites everywhere but Alabama, Mississippi, in parts of Appalachia. Um, uh, so swing voting did happen um, for Obama as well as racialized um, uh, uh, turnout. Uh, how did he succeed in doing that? Because the decline from Dukakis to Kerry was greater than the decline from Dukakis uh, to Obama. Um, and then last, uh, the, the issue of deracialization, which you rightly stressed in electoral terms, could also be asked as, say, William Julius Wilson has in policy terms. And if we wish to affect the life conditions of African Americans, say, uh, or Latinx Americans, um, especially those most poor, which strategy works best in <laughs> terms of a racial or a transracial appeal? Arguably, arguably, um, uh, 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 the uh, Affordable Care Act has done more to affect the life conditions of poor Americans, of many poor Americans, including African Americans, uh, than almost any other recent piece of legislation. It's a transracial uh, uh, piece of uh, legislation. And I'm uh, currently involved, and the last thing I'll say, with uh, in, uh, consulting with congressional staff of uh, Jim Clyburn and of Seth Moulton, Clyburn of South Carolina, Moulton of um, uh, Massachusetts, who are introducing just now a bill into the Congress to rectify um, the racial harms done by racial exclusions in the GI Bill of the 1940s. And um, that's a discussion that, in part, my role grows out of the book that Fred kindly uh, mentioned. Um, uh, but it will be a very interesting test because what they're proposing is an act of rectification for African Americans who were excluded from the GI Bill. That is, it's an explicitly racialized um, uh, racial appeal, uh, racial contour piece of legislation. I actually believe it could pass uh, because of the role of the military uh, in American life and the, the notion that GI Bill was universal in benefits, but African Americans were distinctively excluded because of the decentralized nature of administration, especially in the segregated South. So I'll stop there, but I'd love to hear you on the macro changes and on the distinction between elections and policy making um, along the identity politics line you so fruitfully, Chris, uh, given to us. Chris, uh, we'll go back to you and, and allow you to comment, and then we'll give Wilmot an opportunity. Okay. Um, again, thank you. Thank 
uh, thank you everyone for for comments and thought about thoughts about this. I mean, as expected, these would <laughs> these are things that um, I, I think are really important topics and things that I think shape my own research and and thoughts about uh, uh, about deracialization and identity politics in the United States. So I, again, I thank all of you, both all of you for your your scholarship because I think it's been really important in my own research. Um, I guess I'll start with uh, Professor Harris's comments. You know, I could have written a, a different book, right? Like, I think there's two stories here that are occurring. On one hand, I think with on the Democratic Party side, that the party is becoming more racially liberal, as I discussed, and I talked about the pathway to that. But I think equally as important in changes in American politics is the growth of white identity politics in recent years. And so... While my story focuses on Obama's election uh, and the Tea Party and then Black Lives Matter mobilizing uh, African-Americans, Latinxes, and liberal whites, a similar story could be told where white Americans see Barack Obama as a threat to their position in the United States, coupled with demographic changes, uh, coupled with the results of the 2008 election at the lower level in the House uh, and the U.S. Senate and led to a resurgence of white political identity, which then just changes over time. And so Tali Mendelberg and her, her famous book on racial appeals argue that white voters are turned off by discussions of race because it's outside of the social norm. However, we know in more recent research that white voters become much more accepting of explicitly racist appeals. And so while I argue that blacks become more accepting and more mobilized by Democratic candidates making racially progressive appeals, we see that there's a side of whites who like uh, racially charged or explicitly racist rhetoric. There's a large segment of the white population that doesn't condemn Donald Trump when he doesn't uh, speak out against white supremacy. In fact, they become more mobilized by his actions. And so I, I think that uh, one of the things that and one of the things that I think Trump did and was cognizant of what he was doing was he was going to mobilize his base. He was not going to look for swing voters who would be turned off by racially uh, insensitive appeals, but he was going to hypercharge the number of white racially conservatives or ra people, I won't say white, well, white racists in society, right? That they're going to be more mobilized uh, by his type of outreach. And so in this case, you really have two competing stories. You have a candidate in the Democratic Party, I think, is making more racially liberal appeals and those who are making much more racially conservative appeals over time. And then I think the answer then goes to demography, right? I think the appeals that Donald Trump makes in the 1960s, uh, and we saw it was effective for Nixon in 1968, it was effective for Nixon in 1972, um, and I think in, to a lesser extent, but still uh, successful for Reagan in the 1980s, uh, is that the population was, there was just more of those voters who supported that. With demographic changes, I don't, it becomes harder and harder for the Republican Party to survive without receiving the support of Latinos and African Americans and Asian Americans. Uh, there's a group of um, demographers at the Brookings Institute who have done a lot of analysis looking at what voter, what, how much of the white vote Democrat, the Republicans have to win to, to succeed going forward. And by 2032, if they're going to win any national election, it has to be 80% of white voters. And this includes 80, 20, 20 of those are already strongly Democratic. So you're going to have to take away people who are really entrenched within the Democratic Party. But I think the counter phenomenon of white identity and the growth of white identity politics, which has always been, uh, and I think is grown in recent years is something that is, deserves more, more attention. And I unfortunately didn't do it as much in my book. Um, to doc, uh, Professor Katz, Katz Nelson's point, I think this is correct, right? This is the crux of the argument is that conditions the, I look at conditions starting in 2008, but really the conditions that laid the groundwork for the, the, what we live in today is a much larger trend, right? Uh, and you point out several of these, some of which I discuss a little bit in the book and some of which I don't. So political realignment is one of these, right? Lo the South losing the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party losing the South to the Republican Party has changed 
what is uh, what the strategy should be for the party to win. They basically have to write out right off the South. And as you mentioned, uh, Obama did better than Kerry in most places except for in the South. I believe it's either Alabama or Mississippi. He only received one ten of white male voters or something like that. It was something uh, where it would be really difficult. And I think the process of realignment is something that's occurring now, and we can see it even going into 2020 election around racial appeals. Uh, Non-college educated whites are, are moving in one direction, but college educated whites, particularly those uh, with a higher SES, those who live in the suburbs, are being pushed away from the Republican Party. And I have some other research which shows they become much more responsive to progressive racial outreach. And so what's happening in the country in this realignment uh, is driving, I think, is driving a lot of um, work around identity politics. And I think your call for, for outlining the conditions is so important because one of the things that I thought about as I was writing this book was thinking about the conditions that laid the groundwork to the abolitionist movement in the 1830s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And then the downfall, right? So I'm, I'm also interested in when does it end? Why does it end? And then thinking about the conditions that led to the rise of the civil rights movement in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. And a lot of the things that you touched upon hit the, hit the reasons, explain why we had those movements at those times, right? So religious transformations in the United States were key to the abolitionist movement, as were the civil rights movement, as maybe playing a role in the movement that we're seeing today and discussions around racial appeals today. That's something, unfortunately, I didn't take as seriously enough as I should have in the book. Um, the other thing that I think I do talk a lot about is the decline in trade unions, right? I think the changing economy in the United States has created mass levels of inequality. And that has two effects. Going to Professor Harris's first point is that for some, this creates a sense of racial threat. They're losing their position in society, and that also leads to more support of racial, racially conservative appeals. And on the other hand, African Americans, um, I show this graph in some of my classes, is that African Americans' youth are doing worse today than their parents have, right? And that's not true for all groups. And it's and this is particularly bad for blacks in the middle class. So blacks who had middle class jobs in the 80s and 90s, their children have much wealth and income, less income than they have today. Uh, and that's driven by the decline of trade unions, the, uh, the shrinking of government jobs where, where African Americans were largely hired, which then I think reignites this idea that racial discrimination is still a significant problem, that economic inequality uh, around race is something that needs to be dealt with. I think one thing that I'd like to also add to that is the role of technology and the role of empathy. I think people for a long period of time were not aware of the levels of racial discrimination that are happening to African Americans. So in the 1960s with television, uh, events like Bloody Sunday awakened Americans to the idea that more needs to be done to give blacks the right to vote. Uh, today, the role of technology allows us to see really egregious violence portrayed against uh, uh, black bodies, which then changes attitudes about um, about uh, about about what needs to be done to to rectify these situations. And so, I think your argument is important, and I think more needs to be done to really look at the conditions in the United States. And then I guess finally, policy. Uh, my book is focused more on an electoral aspect, but I think you're right about this. Uh, and my hope is, in my own research and others, that there needs to be more discussions about uh, the, the effect of policies. And so you're, the GI Bill that you brought up, I'd love certainly to learn, to learn more about that. Um, and because I think the context in the United States has been one, as you point out in your previous work, um, where African Americans were largely kept out of any type of opportunity over time until really the 1960s or 1970s, where we become more static in, our, in the economic ladder. People during this period of time can't be born at the bottom and work their way up. Because African Americans were kept out of land ownership in the 1850s and 60s and kept out of these important social services in the 1930s and 40s, uh, as a group, there was just 
really little opportunity to be born into poverty and succeed and rectifying some of those policies, uh, the sins of the past, which lead to this, this condition of, of lack of opportunities for African-Americans, I think is crucial going forward. Let me just frame some of the questions uh, from our audience, because I know people sit through this and also like to engage. And so I'll put out, you know, two or three of these questions at once, and then I'll ask you to start, Chris, but I'd also love for Fred and Ira to jump into when they uh, feel it's appropriate. Um, there was one general question about um, the, the cross-pressured voters in the 70s and whether or not you considered them similar to the moderate uh, voters today in terms of your definition of these voters and how they're impacting uh, the coalitions that form around uh, racialized politics. And then the second question I want to put out at the same time uh, is about uh, the reparations movement. And this goes to the question of context uh, and conditions, as Ira pointed out, um, whether or not the, re the reparations movement itself is, uh, has contributed in some way uh, to either racialization or deracialization. Um, and then thirdly, uh, it's a question about white supremacy in the context of contemporary politics and whether or not um, white supremacy can be understood uh, as a form of identity politics, which I think is a fairly complex question, but very important. And finally, um, the role of deracialization among young voters. Uh, is this uh, something that has a lesser or a greater appeal to young voters today? Uh, in terms of their engagement uh, in national politics. So I'll put all that out there. That all came from our audience members and, and ask you to start, Chris. Okay, I'll, I'll start, but I certainly would, I, I think my, the, my colleagues on the panel know more about this than myself, but I will uh, talk a little Everybody bit about- Everybody can de, de, turn off your mute so you can just jump in at this point when you wanna uh, engage with Chris. Um, so I guess I, I'll start with the cross-pressured question of moderates today and moderates in the past. Uh, I, I think of moderates and cross-pressured voters as being different types of voters in some ways. I think moderates are more afraid of large-scale changes to society and kind of want the status quo. So I, I think they're, they're different types of voters and the role that they play in elections today uh, I still think it's some, right? I, but I, I just think that there's just been a decline in the number of swing voters, right? There were more Clinton Bush voters than there were Bush Obama voters than there were Obama Trump voters. Uh, so we see this kind of pattern where people, particularly people who habitually vote, uh, become less and less swing. It's just hard if you're paying attention to politics, the parties are so drastically different that it's hard to choose a side. Um, the second question around reparations, I think is a really fascinating one. And so a lot of the things that I discuss is ter in terms of racial policies and most of the experiments that I run are focused on things that are generally popular, right? Like voting rights, uh, immigration reform, and reparations is one where there has been a spike in increase in support for reparations uh, in terms of public policy, but it's certainly not as popular as voting rights. Uh, and I think if there's a context where there could be something done around reparations, this would be it. But even that is a heavy, it's a heavy lift, I think. I, I'm, and again, I, I'd like to defer to my colleagues here. Uh, white supremacy is absolutely identity politics. And I think it's the probably the dominant form of identity politics used. Um, it's why it's so hard, I think, for Donald Trump to condemn white supremacists because he sees those who are least sympathetic to the movement as being a significant part of his base. And then I guess finally quickly on young voters, uh, the demographic changes that I talk about are racial uh, and ethnic, um, but I think Part, a real big part of this story uh, is the change in attitudes amongst millennials and particularly Generation Z. Uh, 
Uh, Politico had a fantastic set of articles this week on Generation Z, where they say that even conservatives in Generation Z want more to be done to address identity-based inequality amongst African Americans, Latinxes, LGBTQ uh, women, et cetera. And so I think part of the changes that make uh, racial appeals more effective is that young voters are becoming a larger portion of the electorate. I think this is the first election where millennials will be the first will at least be the majority of the population going into this election. So let's get some comments from Fred and then Ira on this, and then we'll uh, pivot back to Wilmot. Yeah, actually I have a specific question for Chris. Um, so I hate for this to sort of center around you in particular, but I was fascinated by the quote you, the, the quote you presented um, by Charles V. Hamilton about um, deracialization de should not be used every time, you know, it depends on the context. And I guess this goes back to Ira's question mm -hmm. about con um, uh, of conditions. But it also goes to the question when we look specifically at black politics. And so the reparations is also a part of this in a way, because it's also a question about agenda setting and, and expressing the political preferences of a very complex and large community, even though a majority of them vote Democrat. How is it if there's going to be this strategy that this information is disseminated to black communities across the country? How is it that they can coordinate this this idea of when to turn the to accept the appeals or turn or or, or to accept a deracialized strategy or not to be to accept a deracialized strategy? How does this all work out concretely in real politics? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. <laughs> I think maybe my work is more theoretical, but I do have, I guess, some some thoughts about it, right? I think you know I mean, what I just I'm gonna jump in and piggyback on this question so then I won't ask my question at the end because there was some similarity into what um I was thinking. You know, it sounded to me like much of your research makes it look like uh, blacks are just reactive to what <laughs> whites are thinking. And, you know, without bringing into this analysis the campaign, mm -hmm. identity politics as a tool in the campaign, uh, it feels like there's not much distinction between what's inherently part of identity politics that could ultimately be potentially deracialized as a tool for blacks or whites or Hispanics, mm -hmm. and then what, you know, is really the tool of a political campaign that uses this uh, to either depress or mobilize voters. Mm. So thanks, Fred. <laughs> yeah, but, but also to sort of piggyback on what you said, there, there are ideological differences within black communities. There are, right. but there are black, a lot of black social conservatives, by the way, that people don't often recognize. Um, there are also um, black progressives um, and there are also the medium, the, the sort of black liberals. And so how do you kind of, you know, there is the black vote, there's a black constituencies, but they have, they do have varying ideological um, currents that run um, throughout the community. And, and so just thinking about that, and also there are some community, there are some people within the community who who see reparations as a priority, others who don't think it's a priority and, it's, and that it's divisive. So, um, so part of, I think, um, probably getting, giving you, <laughs> or to give you an answer is that there's some sort of political <laughs> education that has to be a part of this. Um, and I think the reason why reparations has sort of emerged as a, an agenda setting item within black politics it's because one, I, I'm speculating here on this point that um, I think there's some disappointment in people's perception of what the Obama uh, presidency could deliver mm -hmm. in changing the material conditions of African Americans. Mm -hmm. So I think- Please go ahead. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you. And again, push me on if, I, if I'm not thinking about this correctly. Um, so I, I guess I have two thoughts about this, and one that I thought a lot, I, you know, I've talked about in the book, and, and I've thought a little bit about afterwards. In the book, and I think one of the shortcomings of the book, in fairness, is that I treat Black voters as a monolith, right? In many ways, I talk about 
And it's all, so as Fred pointed out, they tend to disproportionately and really in high numbers support the Democratic Party. The issues that I talk about in terms of racialized appeals in the book and then in a lot of my other research tend to be one that ha tend to be those which have high levels of support, uh, I think, within the African-American community, like voting rights, for example, right? That's something that even if there's disagreement about uh, other social issues, and I think there's even disagreement within the black community about reparations, for example, uh, the issues that I focused on tended to be those which were more universal, more closely to universally supported amongst African Americans. And I think uh, along that, um, and I think this matters, and there's good work by Valeria Sinclair Chapman that shows this matters, is that there is some symbolism to it. And I think your book, uh, Fred, uh, The Price of the Ticket talks about this a little bit as well, is the uh, African Americans, there is some power, and there's, there's just some power in having someone talk about your issues there can also be a disempowerment effect, right? So like you mentioned about Barack Obama, Barack Obama presents and the expectation is, even if he's not publicly talking about racial issues, the expectation is that he's going to materially change the positions of African-Americans when he has the opportunity to, the wink and nod strategy, I think you discussed in your book. Um, and so in, in my book is more focused on the electoral strategy side of it. And I think it's driven more of the, I, by the idea of, you know, what can candidates do to at least project that they care about African Americans? And I think it all comes down, a lot of my work is really interested in empathy, right? Do you feel like the politician cares about you? Because that matters so much for a long period of time, for most of American history, African Americans were largely disregarded. And to have politicians come out and show that they care, either through substantive or symbolic acts, I think matters a lot. And so I think most politicians, unfortunately, focus more on the symbolic aspect of it, right? So, and, but that's not necessarily devoid of policy, right? So the nomination, Biden selecting Kamala Harris as his, as his vice president is symbolic. Uh, but Kamala Harris likely, and this is true of most black representatives, uh, in the right context, do more for the black community or for and again, I don't want to say black community because I don't want to treat them as a monolith, but do more for uh, African Americans in general uh, than white representatives. And there's tons of work that shows this. So I think in terms of practice, it's it is it is maybe a lot symbolism and focusing on issues which are more universally accepted. Uh, and I don't think politicians, as political scientists like myself, take uh, enough into account that there is a lot of diversity within the black community. I'm gonna ask Ira to jump in here and then we'll have Wilmot uh, give his comments. And then Chris, you'll have the last word. Ira? Very brief historical observation when we talk about swing for voters. Um, arguably in the 1940s into the early 1960s, uh, African-Americans in the North were some of the most important swing voters. They, their their um, party position was unpredictable. Um, of course, before the New Deal, they those who could vote um, uh, outside the South principally um, uh, were overwhelmingly Republican, the party of Lincoln, as opposed to the party of racial segregation and Jim Crow. Um, uh, in the Roosevelt years, the social policies that did include Blacks, uh, not the ones from which they were excluded, but there were relief policies, all kinds of job policies, which um, uh, persons experiencing really terrible poverty uh, appreciated. And there were symbolic gestures, at least by the First Lady, though not by the President, um, uh, which also mattered. Um, uh, but uh, Eisenhower and Nixon um, uh, did exceptionally well in Black America with just votes. And in many states, um, uh, New York's an example. Um, in the Truman uh, Dewey campaign, um, uh, uh, black votes uh, put Truman over the top. And that was, um, in part, a very self conscious result of a self conscious appeal. Uh, it was in the summer of 1948 that the president signed an executive order desegregating the military. Um, 
uh, he understood this wasn't going to appeal to his southern supporters of the era of Dixiecrat, Strom Thurmond voting for running for president and winning the Deep South, but it did make a big difference in, in the North. But arguably, Richard Nixon was a more pro-civil rights candidate in 1960 than Jack Kennedy. Um, uh, and Adlai Stevenson had created, had asked Sparkman of Alabama to be his vice presidential running mate, a Jim Crow a Democrat. So um, we're talking about a liminal moment in which actually African-American voting power um, was pretty profound, ironically, maybe, um, and has become in some ways, in some ways, less so um, as a 90% uh, monolith. Um, that itself is the product of a Republican choice to opt for the Southern strategy and for a kind of um, racialized uh, white identity appeal, um, uh, which was a, a judgment made in the same way earlier by President Taft and um, a long time ago, who, who said, if we're going to compete in the South, we can't will have to accede to the Jim Crow. Um, I think there's been a, a, a division in short, historically, not only the strange bedfellows within the Democratic Party, but the Republican Party historically has been torn from the early 20th century to the present between a party um, uh, on one or another side of, of the race question. Thanks, Ira. I'm going to ask Wilma to comment now. He's been so patient, and I know that we've had a little audio difficulty. Yeah, so um, I've been technically compromised, so I apologize for that. So I really had a question of, uh, for Christopher about where the weight of uh, thinking was uh, in the leadership, um, among the leadership in the African-American community uh, and also elsewhere. And the reason why I asked that question um, if I can use the example of South Africa in this case, uh, of Mandela when he became president, uh, the first offer on the table as an electoral slogan was um, now is the time. And there was, a, there was a group of leaders in the African National Congress who worked together with Stanley Greenberg, in fact, who was uh, the poster for the ANC at the time who said that sounds like revenge. Uh, and they came up with an alternative, which was a better life for all, an inclusive um, uh, slogan. And so that was Mandela, non-racial, uh, no racial appeals at all. And then once he left office, uh, he was replaced by Thabo Mbeki, who made racial appeals. He, he spoke about South Africa as uh, consisting of two nations, not one. And the one was white and the one was black. And with a reference to Charles Dickens then spoke about them living, inhabiting two different kinds of worlds. And the reason why I mention that is that once you start on the road of making racial appeals, you run the real risk of creating racial electoral blocks. And once you do that and they become rigid and fixed, then elections become racial censuses. Now this might be a South African concern uh, because our demography is very different to the U.S., but that is a real risk. And people worry about that because they think that's, that's not very democratic. People are not voting on the basis of issues or policy choices. They vote on the basis of the bloc they belong to. Um, and so what was required probably is a healthy balance between those two kinds of things. So, so, but my general observation is that leaders and what they think make a huge difference so did you have dynamics in society? And the question is, where is the weight of thinking in the leadership? Is it towards a non-racial approach? Is it towards a uh, um, strengthening racial appeals? Uh, and so where is that thinking? And, uh, and wh what, is, what is your sense of the thinking in American um, leadership when it comes to uh, that direction that can be set? Thank you, Wilma. Chris. Yeah, thanks so much for that important question. I hope uh, the other panelists also get a chance to, to weigh in on this. Uh, the leadership, the African-American community, I think, so it's hard to, again, say that there's one group of leaders, but uh, I think this is true in any social movement. There's a lot of research that shows this, is that there is some inequality, right? The movements tend to be, even within movements that are fighting inequality, there's inequality within those movements. 
And so if I were to talk about leadership, I would say it would be probably more conservatives within the African-American community who are discussing issues uh, like the ones that I mentioned, like voting rights, right? So if we look at black members of Congress, this is something that there's a lot of discussion. Of course, there's always bills brought up around reparations, but things like that are much more progressive and tend to get less attention amongst the leadership, amongst elected officials. I think one of the things I want to point to that you, you mentioned was really the discussion of racial appeals and its effect on uh, um, the effect on American politics. Uh, a warning that I discuss is that racial appeals do lead to more polarization. This is a this is a problem, right? So if white identity is becoming a much more dominant part of American politics, seeing the Democratic Party as being more racialized just pushes some whites further to be being more conservative and then maybe some ways more extreme. Uh, and so all racial appeals, I think in the short term are a good electoral strategy. It, it, it certainly needs to be discussed, like what the long-term effect will, of this will be in terms of polarization and in terms of the, the health of democracy. I think it's important, it's so important to really, uh, to really address like the, the inequality in this country has always been bad, but it's just worsening and worsening over time. And so it's important that politicians not ignore this and just ignoring these issues, ignoring racial inequality only exacerbates the problem. So I think it's important to address it head on uh, while being cognizant of what some of the long-term effects might be. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we have sadly already gone over time and uh, this has been really an important discussion. And uh, I just wanna, step in as my role as moderator here just to say thank you uh, to everyone who's participated uh, this this afternoon to chris for the research and enlightening discussion to fred ira and wilmot um, for your commentary and insight uh, this is a complex question and and we really have to be cognizant of conditions and elections and uh, the strategic use of, of racialization and uh, deracialization. Um, it kind of works until it doesn't work in some ways, and that produces a change in politics uh, that, that we can anticipate will continue to happen in American politics because of the need to create coalitions and the differences that will not point out in, Point, pointed out to us between South Africa and the United States in terms of demography. So uh, once again, uh, thank you to the Department of Political Science, SEPA, African American and African Diaspora Studies, and to the Academy, and, and a special thanks to Wilmot for helping us organize once again uh, a very exciting uh, uh, seminar. I hope Chuck gets to see this, I know he would appreciate it. Thanks all of you who attended. Uh, we had an extraordinary attendance today and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Take care everyone.